Good morning. Uh, this is Terry Orovitz, Director of Finance at Housatana Community College. Yes. Welcome to the faculty and staff WebEx interview session. We're going to use the chat faction function to ask questions, and the session will end at 1045. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. I had a link for tomorrow, and so I uh, want to um, uh, want to start off by thanking you for this opportunity to um, be a part of this um, uh, uh, tremendous opportunity to, to to interview for the CEO of Housatonic Community College. And I have a uh, a quick uh, PowerPoint I want to share. And so I want to make sure Do you see the PowerPoint now? Yes, it's visible. Okay, thank you so very much. So again, um, I am honored to um, uh, be a part of this process. And uh, I believe that Housatonic uh, provides so many wonderful opportunities that, that align with my vision for, for higher education. And I want to, for a few minutes, share with you uh, my background and, um, why I believe that uh, education is so important and what role that Pusatani plays for your students uh, and, and for the community makes a difference. Uh, I have a quote that often says that education is the engine that drives opportunity. And I know this not because of something someone told me or some theoretical construct, but it's something that I personally lived uh, my life by. Uh, just some background about me and, and what frame my core values as relates to the transformative power of education. Um, I was born what would be described as, as horrific poverty in St. Louis and perhaps one of the worst neighborhoods in the city. And my mother was born in Mississippi, daughters of sharecroppers, uh, didn't have a, a uh, 12th grade education. My father, who really wasn't around, uh, basically was illiterate, a third grade education. But my mother truly believed in the transformative power of education and how education made a difference. And uh, the foundation of my education comes from the community college. I actually have seven brothers and sisters. One brother has, he's a disabled and so he didn't uh, attend college. But of my uh, siblings, we all attended Forest Park Community College and that made a difference in our lives. And I would uh, say this is that, uh, Throughout this process, we have uh, over 10 college degrees. And for me, I'm, I'm very thankful for that, but also it, 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 it speaks to the, the power of education. It speaks of the power of the community college in terms of, of uh, transforming uh, lives. And so um, who I am, I am a professional with vision. Uh, I am student-centered in my actions and decisions. Um, I believe in access, but with access must come opportunity. Um, I will submit to you that basically there are over 3,000 colleges in the country, and really in America we have access, but the question is, do we have opportunity? So do students have opportunities to be embraced as scholars and opportunities to have mentors and strong, meaningful relationships with each other and meaningful relationship with faculty and staff? that transform, the, transform their lives. Um, Housatonic's mission and vision definitely aligns with my belief and vision for higher education in terms of preparing students and creating opportunities that focus on student success and creating a positive campus culture that supports faculty and staff. I have a 30 plus track record in preparing students for success and creating programs to advance student learning and engagement. Um, I have had a chance to review your strategic plan and it aligns with what I envision uh, higher education should be and my core attributes as it relates to leadership. Uh, so first, I use institutional data to make decisions and I will continue that as selected as the CEO, CEO of Housatana Community College. I will bring more intentionality in moving students through the academic pipeline for greater retention and persistence. I believe that brand awareness is key for institutional growth and so I will work collaboratively to bring a greater awareness and brand identity to the campus. And most importantly, I will bring a more collaborative approach in decision-making. 
this is how I've been, op this is how I've operated in my many years of higher education leadership. I believe that uh, Housatana can be the benchmark community college, not only in the system, but in the nation. I wish to bring the best practices of a community college to Housatana as it relates to student success, faculty and staff engagement. Um, there are three issues, I say it's very quick. There are three issues that confront higher education, particularly in our current pandemic and in a post COVID-19 world. Student success, how could we get more students to the finish line? Um, I looked at the graduation rate and there's opportunity to, for growth uh, at HCC. Uh, affordability, uh, we understand that the, uh, uh, the cost for higher education in America is over $1.5 trillion, the highest it has been in our history. And we also understand that HCC provides an excellent alternative to the high price tag for individuals seeking a post-secondary credential. Providing programs that are relevant and speaks to the needs of local, regional, and statewide stakeholders and producing a workforce, I think that those are the, uh, uh, the issues, and I believe I could bring a sensibility in confronting those issues. Um, I would also say that it's really in, uh, an imperative that the CEO has ability to work with diverse internal as well as external stakeholders. And I am pleased to share that I have been engaged in advancing my institution at the local, state, and national levels. I have participated in various conversations that impact higher education, such as this recent uh, St. Louis Business Journal panel discussion on the future of higher education for the 2.3 million region uh, in St. Louis. Uh, there are more than 30 higher education institutions in our region, and I was fortunate enough to be selected as one of five to represent those institutions. Um, I believe that one of the strengths that I would bring to Houston Community College is my proven ability to connect with key institutional stakeholders in the region, state, and nation. I've met on many occasions with our governor here in Missouri. I've had him on our campus to discuss the issues and also how my institution can provide workforce development for the state. I've engaged with national stakeholders, such as the director of the National Geospatial Agency located outside of Washington, D.C. As a result, we're, we're crafting an educational partnership agreement that will provide externships, internships, collaborative projects with faculty and employment opportunities for our students. The National Science Foundation has provided millions of dollars of institutional grants to my current institution. And I know there's a focus at Housatana for STEM, and I believe that I can uh, 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 connect with those uh, same uh, partners and provide that type of resource to your campus. Uh, and so I've written on higher education, op-ed pieces, and just believe in the power of education and what I should do uh, as a leader in higher education. I'm quite active in my community. I believe that this is important for the next CEO. I will continue this legacy if selected at, as your uh, CEO. I encourage my team to be active in their associations and organizations. This strengthens the brand of Housatana campus and it connects the campus to the larger uh, community. I'm also proud that I've been able to accomplish quite a bit over the years. And what I'm most proud of is that these accomplishments have been for the betterment of students and the overall institution. With a team approach, we have been, we have been, have, we, we've been able to have many partnerships and collaborations. For example, uh, we have a math engineering partnership with St. Louis University. So, so what's unique about this partnership is that Harris Stowe has the lowest tuition rate in the state. A little bit over $5,000 covers all of our tuition costs. At St. Louis University, their tuition costs exceed over $30,000. With a partnership with them, our students pay the $5,000 rate and earn an engineering degree and a math degree. The same approach was taken with Washington University, which is, has one of the highest tuition rates in the country, over $50,000 per year. Our students with an occupational therapy uh, uh, partnership with the School of Medicine there, they pay a little bit over $5,000 a year instead of $50,000. So that's something that we are very, very uh, proud of. And I've secured over $12 million in external funding for institutional priorities. And, then, and under my leadership, we have developed more than 20 significant partnerships 
with local and regional groups that's enterprise leasing. Uh, also uh, in there, which used to be Anheuser-Busch for funding for scholarships, Wells Fargo, and the list goes on and go on. Again, each partnership has led to greater institutional engagement for students, faculty, and staff. Um, I believe that my background, education background, aligns with, with what you see. And so uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go through this very quickly that I have my, my uh, again, attended uh, Forest Park Community College, I earned my, my baccalaureate degree, my master's PhD, uh, did a Harvard uh, MD, MDP program, and also um, uh, I'm a Fulbright scholar. And for me, that speaks of the power of education, uh, keeping in mind that I was a, I'm a first generation college student who was a low wealth or low income student. Uh, my experience in higher education, um, I have uh, served in various institutions. Uh, I'm a faculty member, administrator, so I have a wide variety of um, experiences in higher education. And so I'm going to close by saying that my attributes, the attributes that best describe me and my leadership uh, is that I'm a visionary. I believe in all things are possible. I'm a man of great integrity, and I know that I can uh, uh, bring that same sensibility to Housatonic. And I know that I would need to bring uh, to build a level of trust um, with the campus community, and that's something that I will work for. And then I'm committed. I'm committed to working diligently in ensuring that the mission and values of Housatonic Community College are manifested in its daily operation, the care for students, the care and respect and well-being of the employees that make up the campus community. I am passionate about this work in higher education, and higher education is my only occupation. So I look forward uh, to this next half an hour or so to discuss uh, and learn about you and, and and what you uh, expect for your for your next leader. So thank you so very much, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Would somebody like to start the questions in the chat function? Please let me know if I have any questions because I'm not seeing the questions. Or if you can read the question to me. question up there. Um, what did what attracted you to HCC? Well, that's that's a good question. And I would say that once I um, looked at the website, read the strategic plan, and actually read press releases about your work in the community, uh, particularly the work in STEM, uh, the diversity of the other university of the college, I'm sorry. Uh, that's really what attracted me to Housatonic, uh, just the fact that you're doing this amazing work, but also there is potentiality to do even greater work, particularly in STEM, uh, uh, STEM and STEAM. Uh, you're, uh, I find it very unique and wonderful that you have a focus on fine noise in the museum. Uh, looks beautiful. I mean, I kind of had to do a, a virtual tour of it, but uh, those are the qualities that really attracted me Who's Thank you. Welcome. I have a, a question from a faculty member. Yes. I plan to support HCC as a unique institution in this climate of consolidation. 
Can you repeat the first part of that? Sure. How do you plan to support Housatana Community College as a unique institution in this climate of consolidation? Sure. I, I think it's important that any institution, particularly in a competitive environment, uh, understand their value proposition. What I mean by that, what value does Housatana bring uh, to its students and to the community? And you have to clearly answer that question uh, in order to grow and to, to, to prosper as an institution. And so that really would be my first uh, uh, question and learning more about Housatana. Like I could read about it um, in the on, on the web and look at pictures and read press releases. But it's nothing like sitting down one on one with the, the community, learning about the culture, the values, and then being able to advance that as a leader. Uh, and that's what I've been able to do. You know, particularly when, when you look at uh, competing external uh, funds. And, and and so one of the the, the the areas, as I said before, that I'm most proud of is the ability to connect with key stakeholders. And an example of that, so our institution has been around since 1857, primarily a teaching institution. And so, uh, but we shifted really more towards STEM, but the community didn't, didn't even know about it. So Emerson, which is a major Fortune 500 company that situates about maybe no more than, than 20 minutes from our institution. Uh, when we first reached out to them, uh, they thought, well, we don't, we don't handle a deal with teacher education, but through an education process to let them know, actually we do more than teacher education. We do STEM, we do bio, we do all types of uh, 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 comprehensive uh, uh, disciplines. We were able to get over half a million dollars for them from STEM scholarship. And I can cite some other examples where we uh, uh, put out there our value proposition to stakeholders. And that makes a difference in how uh, the institution is being viewed and how the institution could be successful, again, in this competitive climate. I have an, another question from a faculty member. Please describe a challenging decision you had to make and the process you used to make that decision. Sure. Um, I would say the one uh, that comes to mind um, as the uh, 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 provost, uh, we were going through this dreadful budget crisis in the state of Missouri. And so our, our budgets were cut significantly. And we're one of the, the lowest funded states in the country. And so that was significant for our institution, particularly that we were underfunded. And so we had to look at um, uh, ways that we could still um, maintain optimal service levels, whereas still dealing with this, this, this looming cut from the state. And so what we did, we actually looked at our uh, sections of courses. We offered literally over 700 uh, sections of courses. And we touted this notion that you can work full time and you can attend our institution full time, but it really wrecked havoc on kind of the infrastructure. So in order for a class to make, you only needed four students in the class. And so that meant that uh, if a student dropped a class, <laughs> you had three students. So if two students, did not attend class that particular day, you only had two students. And so working with the faculty members, the, the chairs and the deans, we, we set out a strategy to reduce the number of sections. It was pretty scary at first because we were so used to having classes, I mean, eight sections or 10 sections of a particular area and not one section actually was at capacity. But when we went through this exercise, it was, again, it was, uh, a collaborative approach over the over the course of some time period, we were able to save uh, a couple of million dollars just in that endeavor. And the quality of the engagement of the students was still there. So we instead of having four students in the class, we had 10 to 15 students in the class. And that was still uh, something that we were able to still tout that we had small classroom sizes and the feedback from the faculty and students were pretty positive. So I would say that was one of the ones we had to make some really difficult decisions as a leader, but we were able to weather that. This question is related to accreditation. Sure. Could you tell us about your experience with accreditation? We're up for a NECHI site visit soon. 
how active would you want to be in the process? Well, you know, I am actually, um, um, I looked at Nechi, uh, first I tried to figure out how to pronounce it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so thank you for the reminder, but uh, the, the standards are, are, are basically similar to the Higher Learning Commission. That is the largest uh, uh, accreditation body in the country. And I serve as a peer reviewer. Uh, I've uh, gone on accreditation visits for over 10 schools, different types of schools, and actually completed our first virtual accreditation uh, last week. You know, this was probably been a face-to-face, -face, but with COVID-19, the team did it strictly through Zoom, and it was really an interesting process. So I understand what's needed in accreditation. I would provide the leadership in terms of an, 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 an empowering the team uh, to uh, um, uh, connect and, and put together the, the important uh, documents, you know. And so what I find is that usually, and I look at institutions, their assessment is going to be critical for assessment, uh, student success, um, uh, program review, uh, uh, and even uh, assessment in the curriculum and the co-curriculum. Most people kind of focus on the academic, but what? How do you? know that the organizations that you tout uh, at Housatonic are effective. Um, and, and you have several uh, organizations. Retention and persistence is going to be another one. I know that's going to be a challenge, but how do you tell the story about Housatonic? You know, so I think the retention, not retention, but the, the graduation rate is about 12%. And so how do you explain that to the accreditation body? I, I've had that experience, and so I could provide that type of expert leadership. But again, I respect the, the uh, expertise of the, the team. And I'm assuming that, I shouldn't say assume, I know that you have a team that's preparing for that visit, but I've had many years of experience in accreditation and served as a peer reviewer. And even as president, I went on a couple of trips. So I think that, that kind of sums up my background in accreditation, what I would do as a leader at Housatonic. Thank you very much. Um, you talk about branding as being important. As yeah. we move to one college model, how will you brand HCC to grow enrollment and support persistence, retention, and graduation of our students? Sure. So I've, I've worked in a, a system before where there was one system office and then you had those individual institutions. And so uh, the unique opportunity is, again, this value proposition. Uh, that sets Housatonic apart from the other institutions. It's not a competitive thing, but it's basically there are what you're providing is access to the Connecticut uh, community. However, there are schools that, that are uh, designed or not designed that attract different types of students. So what I would do again is looking at what is, and you hear me say this often, the, the value proposition of Housatonic. Why? Should I attend Housatonic? You know, what sets Housatonic apart from other uh, community colleges uh, in the state? Uh, and so those are things, what are the strengths? So I believe, uh, I believe it's achieving the dream that that's uh, a, a, a particular designation that you all have that no other institutions have. And so telling that, there was another one you received, and I think it might be still the same, uh, that you receive from the Gates Foundation. Those are unique uh, 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 aspects. This whole notion of STEM uh, uh, and STEAM, um, those are the value proposition that the, the uh, Housatonic can bring to the table that sets it apart from other um, institutions. And so what I would do, I would look at how do we uh, look at our strengths, uh, the diversity, that that you have. Uh, that's really what attracted me, the diversity that you have. So there are many things that you should be proud of and embrace, and that makes a difference in the brand identity and the brand awareness that will in, in turn attract students, more students to the campus. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. If, if hired, what are the top three things you would do to lead our school students, faculty, and staff in our community? How would you help them maneuver through this pandemic? Say the first part. I didn't understand the first part of the question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, if hired, what are the top three things you would do to lead our school 
students, faculty, staff, and community through this pandemic? Sure. Um, we're dealing with it here in um, uh, St. Louis. Uh, actually, the first death that occurred in St. Louis was a Harris Stowe graduate. Uh, just learned uh, uh, a couple of days ago, one of our graduates, both her parents were in the hospital. Her father just passed away a couple of days ago. And so, uh, and it's hidden home. And so I think the, 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 what I would do as Lee, which I'm doing now is to provide a very optimistic and, and, and a stable leadership approach. It's always been my belief this too shall pass no matter how horrific it appears and how devastating it might be that this too shall pass and that we need this time to embrace each other, to support each other, to listen, um, listen without uh, judgment. Uh, that's what we're doing now. I'm, I'm fielding some, some uh, calls from students who are apprehensive about the future. Um, also, as much as we can support um, our, our, our college community. So for example, we have not laid off anyone um, during this, this pandemic. Um, also, um, we are um, shifting responsibilities so individuals can work. And so for instance, we have bus drivers who, who uh, uh, ride the buses. And so since there aren't any students on campus, instead of laying them off, we have uh, uh, shifted them to other responsibilities. And so basically the care uh, of the, the, the college community will be first and foremost. But here's another opportunity. When you think about post COVID-19, we will get through this as a country. Uh, you will get this through this uh, as an institution. But what is our response after it is all over? I mean, we will have a different type of world uh, as this thing comes to an end and it will present many opportunities uh, for growth. So the first thing I think about uh, at Housatani, for example, is that most of your students were not in online courses. And overnight, at institutions across the country, we had an online format. And so what, what does that mean for growth and, and, and for development? I know it's kind of rushed, and so some uh, faculty members may not have been totally prepared but this gives Pusatonic an opportunity to grow in the online um, uh, um, community. And so I think as we think about how do we heal and how do we, we stay together and encourage each other and stay safe, we also have these conversations of how do we look, or what would we look like as a post COVID-19 institution? And I think that I can bring some tremendous conversations around those areas. Thank you. Thank you. How would you increase enrollment now that faculty and staff are moving online? Well, that's really the biggest growth. If you think about uh, currently now, there are 46 million, 46 million adult learners with uh, prior college credit and no degree. And about 58% of them, according to aluminum study, they started at the community college. And some of them only need a few credit hours to, to, to finish their credentials, but for whatever reason, they have not. And so um, distance education, using technology to advance higher education is really what's gonna be in the forefront. And those individuals or those institutions that embrace that other ones are gonna grow. And so I believe that, that Housatonic is in the driver's seat when it relates to that, you know, that we can learn from this experience here. Again, uh, we all had to quickly um, engage our students in the online environment. And so I, I do realize, I realize at my current institution, there are some things that could have been, that could be done better, but in terms of crisis, we got to deal with the issue at hand, but as we move past the crisis, we can look at different types of opportunities. And so at Housatonic, that's really the area that you can grow. Um, 
I'm always, I'm, I, I, I'm always at Marvel at, I think it's Southern New Hampshire. And Southern New Hampshire was this small, um, just a small college with I think a $23 million budget. He's really struggling. And uh, Paul, I met him actually at a conference and he tells this wonderful story how he actually uh, had to kind of just be the cheerleader about this new concept of distance education, which really wasn't a new concept. Other schools were doing it, but he's one of the first kind of nonprofit institutions. And so he went from 23 million and about, hmm, I guess about maybe 3,000 students to over 150,000 students and a revenue of over 300 million. And so I'm not saying that Housatonic would grow to 10,000 or to 25,000, but those are opportunities uh, to particularly to tap in those um, adult learners in Bridgeport and also in the Connecticut area and beyond and they could take advantage of this opportunity. So that's really the, the major uh, uh, growth. And I would say this very quickly, and I understand this is a long answer, but I, we have to deal with the retention aspect. You will find in your data that uh, students who are full-time are more likely to be retained than those who are part-time. And so one of the things we had to do, which we had to do, but we basically encourage students to take 15 credit hours. And it seems like, a kind of intuitive for a first generation low wealth student, but we found that the students met the bar and we find that we were able to retain more students this year before the pandemic. We had about a 90% fall to spring retention and our retention numbers have increased significantly by dealing with the reason for attrition and, and, and those sorts of things. So I'm going to stop here, but those are some of my suggestions. Thank you. Uh, the next question is a two part question. What is your management style? And could you think back to the best leadership you've ever worked with? And what did you like about that person's management style? Okay, great, great, great. And I'll be very quick because I know I'm running out of time. So I, I lead by doing. And so I'm, I, I serve by serving. And so uh, that's one area. I empower individuals to do their job. I'm not a micromanager. I believe that people have the skill set, they have the ability. I'm collaborative in my approach. And so all of the success I've talked about is really was a collaboration among different key individuals. And so, so I, I would say the best groups that I've worked with are those who are really passionate about the work. You know, and I think about what we need to do to move students to credentials and to, to help them to be transformed as I was transformed. Uh, I The people that I work with that are passionate about their work, uh, they they place the students at the center of every decision. Those are the the best groups that I've worked with. And so um, I, I, I would say that those are the areas of my leadership and, and those individuals that um, I think are the best to, to work with, that I've worked with in the past. How would you describe your own management style? Again, my management style, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, again, I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not a micromanager. I lead by doing, I, 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 I set an example of what I um, um, expect. So I'm accessible, you know, so I have an open door policy. Um, I, my management style is that uh, I empower individuals to do with their jobs. And so uh, in terms of of uh, uh, say my cabinet, I have my cabinet. We, I have all the different people who work uh, with me and I don't even call it my subordinates, I call it my team. That we're on this even playing field and each of each of my team members have a role to play and I'm not gonna supersede that. Uh, and I'm optimistic. I would say that's probably one of the biggest strengths that I bring in my leadership and I'm optimistic and I'm always, in spite of what goes on, that we can be better and we can do better. And an example of that is that uh, when I first came to my campus, we were not getting any external funding. And there was a pessimism that pervaded the place. And I came in just saying that we deserve the best things in higher education. And the second year that I was here, I was able to, to land a $2.5 million grant, the largest uh, grant in the history of the school. And my largest grant to the institution was 5 million. And that opened up the door for individuals to seek out different types of external funding because of that optimism that, that I hope uh, that pervaded the institution. And so I hope that kind of cleared up a little bit in terms of my, my, my leadership and management style. It does, thank you. 
Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left in this session and we won't be able to get to all the questions. We can pick them up in the in the next faculty staff session this afternoon. But I think we have question time for the next one. Our student advisor ratio is over 700 to one. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea on any ideas on how to address this issue? Well, you know, uh, I would have to be there to kind of look at budgets, but I do understand that advising is a critical and key component of student success. That when you have a, an advising system that uh, sets the blueprint and helps students realize that the their, their pathway and their, the roadmap, you're more likely to keep those students, students who are, are um, academically and, and they call it academic academic integration and social integration. That's theory, student development theory. But the key and the linchpin to that are faculty advisors. So that would be really my priority to how do we how do we uh, uh, provide more resources so we can have more advisors. Uh, it just in the long run it pays off. When you look at the students that you lose uh, because of uh, attrition. Um, and investing in more advising makes a difference. And that's what really we did here at my current institution. We actually invested in more advising and we call them student success coaches. They went from advisor, academic advisors to student success coaches because they're coaches students of student success. And, and that again, that has made a difference. Okay, thank you very, very much. And we will see you at the student session in 15 minutes. Thank you so very yes, much. I appreciate the time.